Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. I am excited for this episode. It is part three of my conversation with Patricia Coulter, and it is on her brand new book, The Infinite Mercy of God, which has the words of both Sophia Cavaletti and Pope Francis on the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation in God's deep love and mercy that flows from this sacrament. I hope you enjoy. All right, Patricia, round three. Welcome to the podcast again. Oh, I'm so happy to be together with you again, Carrie. Thank you. (laughs) I love having you on the podcast. This has been a lot of fun to get to know you. Mutual. So just in case anybody who might be listening to this specific episode who did not listen to the previous two episodes that we were blessed to have you on, um, let's just quickly say who you are and um, your involvement with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So, okay. who are you? I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll try to keep it short and hopefully sweet, Carrie. Um, <laughs> I am the grateful recipient of many amazing graces. Hmm. And in the context of what we're going to be sharing this morning, my path, well, I should say God's path for me, although I didn't know it at the time, led to Rome. I thought it was a once-off year to study with Sofia Cavaletti, Gianna Gobi, the incredible colleagues, friends, and community gathered around their little center dedicated to the catechesis of the Good Shepherd. But Carrie, I think I mentioned to you, when I went to Rome in 75, Uh, It was to be a once-off. And when June came and the atrium was finished, the course was finished, I realized uh, I was being coaxed to come back and complete the second year because the formation there at that time was two years. Hmm. And mine had been pretty much full-time already. So I came back and once again got the little bits and pieces that I had made or found or been given in Rome, put them in a bag, and started knocking on doors. And once again, my family, so supportive, uh, just surrounded me with care and support, and I got back for another year. And that became, I remember asking Sophia once, I, I can't remember how I phrased it, doesn't matter. It was their answer. And it was kind of like, I was in my mid-20s then, like, you know, kind of about life and how you end up in certain places and, um, you know, the choices we make. And she just said simply, life chooses us. Mm -hmm. By which she meant capital L, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so here we are 48 years later, (laughs) and uh, we're going to be talking about um, something that has been asked for for almost all that number of years. But I was only now, with the help of so many people, able to kind of put together and what what really makes me smile, Carrie, it's such a tiny little book, isn't it? It is. It is. But I, I appreciate that. <laughs> me too. So we have this book, The Infinite Mercy of God, this brand new book that you have brought to us. Tell us, Patricia, what? how did this book come to be? Okay. Um, there are two, well, I'm going to say three basic dynamics that um, really are at the moving, the motor of this book. Mm -hmm. One is this sacrament as a healing encounter. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I don't know how many know that in uh, the church, the Roman Catholic tradition, there are two 
sacraments called sacraments of healing. One is the anointing of the sick, and the other is this sacrament. By the way, it has three names that different people use, penance, confession. I've used reconciliation. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And I thought, who knows that? You know, don't you love the word healing? Mm -hmm. The next thing is, for any who have um, become involved or even had a, uh, how shall I say, just a passing acquaintance with the catechesis, and, and in particular, this sacrament, maybe they're like me. And so many of the parents, adults, and certainly children, I've been privileged to accompany. It all comes as total gift, kind of surprisingly, because let's be honest, this is a sacrament. Um, how shall I say? I don't want to be contentious. <laughs> that most people don't see as gift. Thank you. Perfect. And the third is there is something um, about the way it is lived in the catechesis, or shall I say, going way, 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 way back to Sophia and Jana in 1954, their approach to it that really, um, I think, is one of the greatest but hidden treasures of the catechesis. Mm -hmm. So the words that you used throughout this book they come from a very unique place. They come from the recordings that you had of Sophia. Is that correct? Um, there is a line from a favorite Irish poet called Patrick Kavanaugh, and it's this, God is in the bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. So when it came to, well, what can, what can be passed on to others who don't know the catechesis, never heard of Sophia Jana anything, who may never cross that path. So I went back to looking at different, literally, pieces I had. And so as, as we kind of mentioned before, I'll keep this brief, um, I was very gifted in not knowing a word of Italian. <laughs> when I went to Rome because mm -hmm. I, I taped them. And so these chapters come from those tapes. They're actual transcriptions. And uh, that's why I've named, the, like each chapter has two names, Sophia and then a little piece by Pope Francis. But mm -hmm. the Sophia is all Sophia. I simply added the chapter headings and subheadings. Mm -hmm. So these are Sophia's words that we have never heard before within these chapters. I believe so. I, I call it unpublished. And um, yes. Yeah. When I was reading this book, I felt like I was reading chunks of the formation that I've received through level one and level two and level three. It was it was beautiful because it was like getting to revisit some of the key points of those formations within this text. And I so appreciated being able to read Sophia's words and how maybe she talked about those key points of our formations. Thank you for saying that, because um, that really touches me because I thought, how do you keep it essential? How do you keep it mm -hmm. basic? Uh, Sophia and Jenna were were masters at that. I'm not. So I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful to hear that some of the chunks that you think are important are here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that is what I felt. So tell me about your connection between Sophia's words and the Pope Francis words. Okay. I, I would like to get uh, personal, if I may. Please. Okay. Um, and I'm going to refer to one of the tiny pieces in the book by Padre Dalmazio Mangilo. Mm -hmm. Who was a close collaborator with Sophia. Very close. Remember we mm -hmm. talked about that circle of friendship? Yes. He was so part of it. 
And actually, yes. Sophia named him as her master teacher in moral mm. theology. And he was named master teacher in moral theology by the Dominican order, which is oh, wow. the highest level of recognition one can obtain. And in 1993, Jana was pushing everybody to call the catechists from around the world to come to Rome and let's talk about where we go from here because they wouldn't mm. live forever. Very practical, right? Right. And right. they set up, um, so they asked like for two from the different countries. And then they asked, the circle got together and decided Silvana would give us a reflection. And of course, Sophia and Jana, I believe Tilde, but also Padre Mangilo, who decided to speak about the experience and sacrament of reconciliation. Hmm. So I took part of that. I, had tr I did a spontaneous translation, <clears throat> which was later transcribed and edited, um, sorry, uh, by a wonderful uh, American catechist. And then I took it and edited it down just to give his take on the process that happens in our heart when this healer, this lover of our souls, is calling us to this personal encounter with healing love. But I remember him saying, "We now this is Manjila, we only know two things in life. I mean, really know. We know what we love and we know what we suffer. It, the point being, in our life's path, we meet many obstacles, mountains, valleys, sufferings of soul, mind, body, heart that need healing and that there is a time and place when we can meet our healer. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about him and putting this work together, what really has struck me about Pope Francis is his pastoral emphasis. I don't know if you've noticed the cross he wears, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the Good Shepherd. Yeah. Carrying a sheep with all these other little sheep gathered around them. And he has that famous line calling us, especially those in ministry to have the smell of the sheep about yeah, us. Yes, from Joy of the Gospel. Yeah, it's one of my favorite lines in Joy of the Gospel, that we need to smell like the sheep. Isn't that wonderful? And I love that. A favorite line of mine is, he said, you know, the church is a field hospital. Yeah. We're about going out and finding yeah. the embattled, the besieged, the bruised, mm -hmm. the broken. He said, we can talk about things like cholesterol later, <laughs> I love that. But he's it's said, a great analogy. Isn't yeah. It? it is. And um and one of his big, big passions is this sacrament of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Mercy. And I um in listening to him and reading his works, uh, you know, to hear him call it a sacrament of joy. Mm -hmm. Sacrament of Resurrection. I thought this is so in harmony with the spirit of what Sophia and John and that whole community were dedicated to. Yeah, they would have gotten along really well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a risk to assume that. You know, I didn't have Sophia <laughs> to check in with. And so I just tried to put in a few points of real resonance between the message that the catechesis bears into the world and the one that he's carrying into the world. Mm -hmm. And the key for me is the key of tenderness. That returns again and again. And it, there was a phrase of Sophia that 
I love reading her in Italian. Not that I'm that good at it, but um, it just takes me back to, uh, as I said, Tina Lillig would say, every word of hers matters. And it was this phrase when she was writing about this. How do we position ourselves before the limitless tenderness of God? Hmm. Isn't that a wonderful thing to reflect about? I know. That's what I was just thinking. I need to sit with that for a little bit. How do I position myself between the infinite tenderness of God? Whereas, if I can be very honest, once again, I think there are so many for whom reconciliation is not only a gift, as you said, but it's anxiety provoking. Right, right. Or they don't want to have anything to do with it because mm-hmm. they've had negative experiences or heard about others' negative experience. And only Pope Francis would have the boldness to use this phrase. It's not a torture chamber. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to go through his words. Google search, Pope Francis, not a torture chamber, (laughs) to see how often that comes up. But for so many, it is a variation on that theme, so sadly. That's one of the things I've always appreciated about our our work in Catechesis of Good Shepherd in regards to reconciliation, especially reconciliation prep for the young child, because... I feel like it's an antidote to the way most of us experienced our first reconciliation. I remember mine, I was so consumed with fear because I was so worried about memorizing the darn act of contrition. And that's all I could think about the whole time. Um, So my hope for my children and for the children that I am blessed to help prepare is that it's, it's a celebration and it's, it's full of joy and mercy. And that is where the focus is. And, and it's been fun to watch children have beams on their faces whenever they get to celebrate the sacrament for the first time using this model, because I know that that felt experience of joy connected to the sacrament is going to be a beautiful foundation for the rest of their life in regards to the sacrament and make them want to continue to return to this beautiful love of mercy of God that's that's not a torture chamber. (laughs) It's, It's just a beautiful antidote to what most of us have experienced. Yeah, I like that word because it makes me think again of healing, of medicine, of health, of restoration. And you've just uh, kind of said, what is the hope of this book? Yeah, that was going to be my next question is what what is your hoping for? Well, I think part of it is, this isn't about Sophia, maybe you've heard this, would often say about their work, we did not invent anything. Mm -hmm. What this is, is simply what is most alive, most living, and most enduring in our tradition, and more importantly, most essential. And so how do we, how do we offer, Carrie, kind of those essential chunks, as you said? And uh, here's an example Sophia uses. She said, you know, in the parable of the Good Shepherd, For thousands of years, it's been written about, prayed about, and she says, like from the first fathers of the church. And what seems to be the kind of essential put forward is that Jesus lays down his life for us, which is the momentous moment of his life and ours. But she said, you know, she discovered something else about that parable that's been overlooked for thousands of years. And it's what she discovered in sharing it with the children. And that is, the good shepherd knows my name. Hmm. So it's basically, same thing happened here. They go to the roots of the 
right of reconciliation. Take what is most essential and what is kind of still very new to people. St. Augustine would say, O oh, beauty, ever ancient, ever new. Mm. And so I think, um, you know, we're coming up to our 70th anniversary of the catechesis. It may take another 70 years for this aspect to contribute to the renewal and revival of this sacrament. But mm -hmm. my hope is that in this tiny book, maybe there are some glimpses of that have been overlooked in the beauty of this sacrament. Mm -hmm. And to try to just shine a light on them, it, 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 there's a lot it doesn't do, a lot of answers, questions it doesn't even attempt to answer. But it mm -hmm. does attempt to kind of communicate its primary message, and that is the gift of, to use Sophia's words, the limitless tenderness of God for all of us, always. It's kind of like, um, if I could use another biblical quote, Isaiah 43, where the Lord declares, you are precious in my eyes. Mm. You are honored, and I love you. Or um, that always makes me think of an image that is used in the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. And he calls each of us, he's talking to God and saying, it's kind of the very last two words that he discovers through his ups and downs and hard life that God wants us to know each of us is an, quote, immortal diamond. <laughs> and so many of us don't know that. So the book is a way for people to sit with that knowledge that you are that immortal diamond, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I see this book as such a beautiful, you know, that, that idea is very much woven through our formation as catechists in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And so I see it as a way for catechists to sit in a slower way with the words that help them ponder who they are in the light of God's love and mercy. But I also see it as a way, this book as a way of helping parents or other adults um, in the church who it is not their call to go to formation right. in the Catechese of Good Shepherd yes. to be able to also sit with the the love and mercy of the Good Shepherd. Um using the words of Sophia and Pope Francis as a guide to that heart of who they are and who he is in, in, in who he is. And, um, yeah, that's beautiful, Carrie, that that's the hope, you know, it's meant for us all. There's only one right of reconciliation, but, um, to get back to that image of, um, diamond, you know, so let's look at this, experience of reconciliation like let's hold it up to the light you know like there's this diamond and as you turn it around you know how it sparks here's a little uh, the facet you know sparks this way and that way and what it means if um and i also really appreciate the word you use slow you know if we could slow down and allow ourselves um which, you know, we deserve to be set free. We deserve to have new life. It's God wants it for us so much. And to allow, allow ourselves, as Pope Francis would say, even though it's very difficult, allow ourselves to be loved by God. Mm -hmm. Would you allow me just to share a very personal experience? Mm-hmm. Because when you said that about as adults, you know, what this could possibly mean to us, a very, very important inspiration in, in kind of staying with this seven-year slow journey of putting these pieces together was my brother, Tim. And near the start of it, he um, 
was diagnosed with ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I, I have, okay. yes. And um, what was so beautiful is he was surrounded by the constant and loving care of his beautiful wife, 24-7, his wonderful family. And yet, it's a, it's a difficult journey. And he shared with me something that happened, I, I would say perhaps a year and a half before he died, there was a Franciscan priest who was visiting the parish and the deacon in the parish who would come to Tim said, would you like him to come and celebrate confession? Tim jumped at it. Well, he came and he's, I think, what uh, Pope Francis would call a merciful confessor, of whom I've met many. But this one came to Tim and Tim said, you know, I mean, he was a lifelong Catholic, a man of faith. But he said, you know, he was at the point where you have anxieties, you have doubts, right? And he brought everything to that moment with that young, as I understood, Franciscan friar who signaled to Tim his respect by Tim was in a chair and it was on oxygen and so on. This Franciscan friar pulled over a little tiny footstool, sat right beside him. And I could almost picture it. He was lower than Tim. And Tim said he had never experienced the mercy of God. That it actually, this priest had said, Tim, you know how much Jesus loves you. And you know he's waiting for you with open arms. And so Tim actually chose for his gospel for the funeral the found sheep parable. Mm. Because he the sense was he didn't say it, but it was understood that that moment of reconciliation was literally the good shepherd coming, finding him. Hmm. And pouring out his mercy. So up to that point, I, I was trying to think of the title, but when Tim told me that, uh, he didn't know, but he named the book because it was an experience of the infinite mercy of God for him. Hmm. Hmm. That's very dramatic, Carrie, but that's how important this sacrament can be in, in transforming someone's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very dramatic, but absolutely true. And it wasn't through, you could almost think, well, maybe the anointing of the sick. No, this was the sacrament, the healing sacrament of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. Before we finish, is there anything that you want to close off with before we finish today, Patricia? Um. I guess uh, I appreciated when you spoke about your experience as a child and how different it is now for your children. And um, I have to say that one of the surprising, you know, that book title by C.S. Lewis, Surprised by Joy, one of mm -hmm. the greatest surprises of joy in this long beautiful path is to have met so many priests who have been so touched themselves by celebrating the sacrament in this way with children mm -hmm. and adults. And yeah. it brings me back, um, if you'd allow me, um, to a quote by that other Franciscan friar. You can tell I've got a heart for Franciscan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his name is Raniero Cantalamesa. And in his Lenten reflection on March 17th, he, he said these uh, I, three sentences. He said this, the most beautiful news that the church has 
the task of proclaiming to the world the one that every human heart expects to hear is God loves you. Mm -hmm. Now here's, here's the one. This certainly must eradicate and take the place of the one we have always carried within us, which is God is judging you. Mm. His last sentence, the truth that quotes God is love 1 John 4, verse 8, must accompany, like a bass note, every Christian proclamation. Mm -hmm. And I guess what the catechesis is is proclaiming and Mm -hmm. Pope Francis is preaching is, Mm -hmm. no, God is not judging you. God loves you. Mm -hmm. It's that basic. Yeah. I feel like there's such a need for so many adults for this healing, you know, from the God is judging to God is loving. Um, I'm grateful for this work and in the, in your book that highlights it again to help us kind of ponder that because, you know, once you have that foundation of God is judging, it's kind of hard to uproot that. But so I think it's going to take time, but yeah, I agree that that's a beautiful quote. It's so true. We do have that that foundation of um, God is judging rather than God is loving. And and we have some work to do on our own hearts, that's for sure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patricia. I appreciate you sharing for the last three episodes with us all your beautiful wisdom and experience and and the gift of this book, The Infinite Mercy of God, that you have brought us and that you persevered to bring it to us. I really appreciate that. Well, Carrie, it's people like you, your encouragement, your enthusiasm, your openness that really um, is like oxygen on the path. (laughs) You know what I'd like to do? Can I close with uh, this Sunday is Good Shepherd Sunday. Mm-hmm. And can I, it's, this will sound like a contradiction. May I close with the opening words for the Mass for next Sunday? Please. There's only a few. So here's the entr- entrance antiphon for the Feast of the Good Shepherd. The merciful love of the Lord fills the earth. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Patricia. God bless. God bless you. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. If you would like to get your hands on Patricia's brand new book that we talked about, The Infinite Mercy of God, there is a link in our show notes for you to be able to go to the CGS USA store and purchase her book. Remember, whenever you buy any books or supplies or atrium materials from our CGS USA store, your purchase has a purpose and you are supporting our work in CGS USA. So thank you so much for that. Don't forget that this summer, we encourage you all to do the book study on ways to nurture the relationship with God, which Patricia Coulter also did with Sophia Cavaletti, which we spoke about in previous episodes. So we have podcast episodes for each of the four chapters of ways to nurture the relationship with God to enhance your book study experience. We also have some questions on our website that you can download and print and use for your book study as well. All of that information is in our show notes. So get together with your friends and co-catechists, parents, other parishioners from your parish, and check out this really amazing book, Ways to Nurture the Relationship with God. It's a great book to use as a summer book study. Don't forget that you can also submit questions for the podcast that we could answer on the podcast. So there's a link in our show notes if you have any questions about the catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Just let us know. We'd be happy to answer them. We also have the audio version of The Religious Potential of the Child by Sophia Cavaletti, which is our main text. It is read by Rebecca Reutsevich. If you would like to pay to have access to the audio version of that book, we have some videos and step-by-step instructions on how to access the Podbean premium channel that gives you access to all the chapters of the audio version of The Religious Potential of the Child. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. 
If you would like to know more about the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member and support our work and get access to member-only material, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.